faculty, a faculty member in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures. And it gives me particular pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, dear friend and colleague, uh, Alessandro Achilli. Uh, Dr. Achilli uh, is originally from Italy, as you may have guessed. Uh, he has received uh, his uh, doctorate from the University of Milan. And uh, for the past several years, he's been teaching at Monash University in Australia. Uh, and uh, this uh, is really wonderful to see how the field of Slavic studies is becoming so strongly integrated uh, across different countries and continents around the world. And uh, the planet, in this sense, is becoming much, much smaller. And uh, in uh, Australia, in Melbourne, uh, where Monash University is located, Dr. Arkili has been doing <coughs> wonderful work. And it's been a distinct honor for me to be there earlier this semester in July for a wonderful conference on Ukrainian culture in global contexts that he organized. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome him now here uh, in North America, on the other side of the planet. <laughs> so having flown to Australia and back, I know what a long flight it is. So <laughs> you know, it's pretty long. Thank you for coming here and being here. Uh, Dr. Kili is part of a really wonderful uh, group of uh, Italian uh, Slavists, or Italian trained, uh, but, you know, because they're now all over the world, Slavists of the younger generation who have explored various aspects of Ukrainian culture and history. His own dissertation was based on the work of uh, one of uh, Ukraine's uh, greatest modernist poets, uh, Vasil Skus. Um, besides uh, Italy and uh, Australia and visiting us today, he has another connection to uh, the United States, and that is Dinesh Clark, postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. And his topic today is related to one of the classes uh, that uh, we offer in the Islamic Department with Professor Alexander Wallow. And uh, this is a really wonderful class that, to my Knowledge is only offered currently at two universities here and at the University of Toronto. And this is the exploration of the Kyiv text. That is how the city of Kyiv across the centuries has been represented in uh, literary cultural texts more broadly, including texts in many different languages. So uh, the topic of uh, Dr. Akili's lecture today brings us to Kiev in contemporary literary discourse. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Alessandro Akili. Uh, thank you very much, Vitali, for this extremely kind introduction. Thank you very much for um, inviting me to Lawrence, to the University of Kansas. It's a huge honor uh, and pleasure for me to be here. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Vitali, to Justena, to Ani, and to uh, the other staff of the Slavic Department and of Greece. And thank you uh, to all of you for coming today. I know it's, if I'm not mistaken, the last week of the semester, so I know it's a very, an extremely busy period. So once again, thank you very much for finding time for this lecture. And I also very much like this space where we're gathered today. We don't have anything like that at Monash. It's really beautiful with a lot of uh, beautiful books and a very warm atmosphere. I really, I'm really happy that I'm here in this moment. Um, and I'm also uh, happy to have the chance to somehow contribute to one of the courses that uh, have been taught uh, here at uh, KU uh, this semester. Um, I don't know exactly which texts uh, have been uh, read and uh, discussed. Maybe some, uh, the texts that I'm going to talk about are pretty recent, uh, at least some of them. So maybe you might uh, have already encountered some uh, 
uh, of, of them, we'll see. If, uh, uh, if yes, I'm sorry for the repetition, if not, we will have the chance to discuss a new text together. So once again, the title of my lecture is Redefining the Urban Text of Ukrainian Literature, Cave in Contemporary Ukrainian Poetry Between War uh, and Peace. Uh, so, in my title, I talk about contemporary Ukrainian poetry, contemporary Ukrainian literature, and I think that first of all, we should ask ourselves what contemporary Ukrainian literature is, what we mean by this term, what its boundaries are. Um, I think, I propose that we uh, should have two competing chronological uh, frameworks for contemporary Ukrainian literature, uh, a broader one and a more specific one. Uh, the broader uh, framework encompasses the period between 19, 1991 and uh, the present day and 2018, while the second framework, the smaller one, um, encompasses the period from 2014 to um, 2018. And in a way this um, second um, smaller um, chronological framework reflects the French idea of extreme contemporain, of extreme uh, contemporary. Uh, why have I chosen 2014 as uh, the starting date for the second, the stricter uh, chronological framework? Because as we know uh, 2014 was the year uh, in which uh, the violent phase of Euromaidan, of the revolution of uh, dignity started, it was the year in which uh, Russia uh, annexed uh, uh, Crimea and the war in uh, the eastern part uh, of Ukraine uh, began. And of course these uh, tragic uh, historical events uh, have had a, a huge impact on Ukrainian culture, on Ukrainian literature and we can observe all this in uh, several of the texts that have been written since um, 2014. Um, um, as we know, the situation in uh, Ukraine is constantly evolving. Uh, in the last, in the very last weeks, uh, it has been changing again. It has been evolving again. So literature is constantly uh, recording these changes, and it's enough to have a quick glance, a, a quick glance uh, at Facebook, for example, at the pages of the several Ukrainian writers and people of culture that uh, post their poems, uh, post their pieces of prose, comment on the situation in Ukraine today to see how deeply culture reflects on what is going on in um, Ukraine today. So our focus today will be on uh, very recent texts, but before talking about texts that have been written in the last um, three, four, five years, uh, we will also have a look uh, at contemporary Ukrainian literature in the broader sense of the term, talking about texts uh, written in uh, the early 90s and in uh, the early years of the new uh, millennium. Um, being Kiev, the capital of a state which finds itself um, at war, I've chosen to analyze how uh, war has entered poetry centered on Kiev, even if, as we know, uh, the city is around 400 miles uh, away from the war zone. That is why I think it's fascinating to observe these dynamics of war and peace in a city which is not exactly in a war zone, but which still is the capital of a country which unfortunately finds itself uh, um, at war. War. And in order to appreciate the breadth and the variety, the diversity of contemporary Ukrainian literature, and in particular of Kievan culture, um, I've decided to include texts in two languages, uh, that is Ukrainian and Russian. Uh, written by two young poets who are not originally from Kyiv and who moved to the capital for um, different reasons and from different parts of Ukraine. The two authors that we will be talking about more in specific are Pavlo Korobchuk and uh, Iakiva, both born in 1984. Um, I know that um, Alexandra uh, has uh, dealt with several languages in uh, her uh, Kiev Center course. I will limit myself to just two languages today, but I think it's uh, important to once again uh, remind us of how uh, Ukraine has always been multicultural and multilingual. 
Uh, so, before uh, moving to the core of the lecture and reading some texts by uh, Korobchuk and Kiva and uh, try to at least partially unpack them, we'll briefly discuss poems written in the early phase of contemporary Ukrainian literature in a broadened sense, uh, that is between the 1990s and uh, the new years of, of the new millennium. Uh, in doing so, I'd like to give a brief sample of a more traditional, if you want, image of Kiev than the one we encounter by poets such as Korobchuk uh, and Kiva. Um, the first example I've chosen is taken from uh, the poetry of Attila Mohilny. Uh, Attila Mohilny is a relatively little known uh, Ukrainian poet who died prematurely in uh, 28 and who pretty strongly uh, impacted the history of the Kievan text um, in Ukrainian uh, poetry. Um, a collection of uh, Mohilny's uh, poems uh, was published in 2013 by a rather influential Ukrainian uh, publishing house, uh, Ababa Halamaha, uh, and I think that this publication uh, might have the chance to boost uh, Mohilny's popularity, hopefully, at least. Uh, so here, as you can see, we've got uh, two images of Kyiv in uh, peace and in war. The second image is, of course, taken uh, from uh, the early days of the most violent uh, part of the Euromaidan, of the Revolution of Dignity of 2013-2014. And we'll now move to our first text for, to for, text for, uh, for today, that is uh, a poem by um, Attila Mohelny. Uh, I... Mm, I've provided some uh, very basic, very rudimental attempts at English translations of my text. Uh, I feel more confident to read the Ukrainian uh, and Russian originals, and you can have a look at the translation um, on the screen. Uh, okay, let's start with our first act for today. Kvartale, jaki ja že ma buď nezabudu, i ci dvore, što pamiataju, jak zvenili naši hitare. Jak mi išli zvici podinci, pokladajući liše na šćastja te na skupu pravdu naših vulic. I čas vid času kožen z nas vrtao se, što micno micno preteskati se plečema do tvrtih stin cih pjetovrhovih budinkiv. I može najbiljša čestnist, ke jivsko predmistja v tomu, što nas nikoli ne petali, kudi mi idemo. Uh, this is a poem written and published by uh, Mohilny in the early uh, 1990s. Um, I think this text is quite representative of Mohilny's poetry and it's fascinating because it is um, at the same time a testimony of uh, the rather vibrant atmosphere of liberation of the late Perestroika Prebudova time. Uh, but it also uh, is a sort of ahistorical uh, construction, uh, something stuck in the timelessness of myth, as we will see more specifically in uh, a second poem by uh, Mohilny that we will um, read very soon. Uh, what do we observe in this poem when it comes to the image uh, of Kiev? So we see that the city is strong. Uh, it's characterized by the very solid, very strong um, walls of uh, its houses, of its uh, five-story buildings, that is those buildings uh, built uh, in uh, um, Khrushchev's era, uh, very probably. Um, and we see a very positive, um, if you want, interaction between people and the city. Uh, people, in a way, feel empowered by the city when they get in touch with uh, the body of the city. Uh, they feel more powerful, they feel also free at the same time. Uh, nobody asks them what they are going to do, where they are going to go, they feel absolutely free. The city is for them a space of self-realization, of self fulfillment. Um, in the second poem by Mohilny that we're going to read, uh, as I already mentioned, we see something slightly different. Uh, we see um, um, 
a more mythical, if you want, image of uh, Kiev that is in a way stuck uh, in time. Cej sad na horách, lehký vysoký v snihách, rýzblený stežkáme. Není bezľudný cej sad, my u ňomu, soboju jeho dopovňujemo. Svítlo chyského robene červone i biele, my myš same ti videmo. Místo vnezu na pričalach ležat katere vyrubani z krehy. Místo jak na doloni, s pravami svojimi živé, zítka nezbohnil i tumanil. Sad nad vedobečem korolivna variaska v slovjanskih nutrah. This is something, as I mentioned, quite different from uh, the previous poem uh, that we uh, have read. Uh, here we, we don't see the new cave, that is the Soviet cave, with those five-story buildings built in the 1960s. We see something completely, completely different. We see the old, the ancient cave, uh, which is, of course, uh, not less solid, not less strong than uh, the new one. Um, we see uh, um, that the action is set in Vedubici, which is one of the oldest parts of, um, of the city. And basically we see that um, Kyiv and um, the garden where um, this poem um, is uh, set is in a way identified with the Varyak princess in Slavic spirit. Uh, we see of course um, an idealized image uh, of Kyiv which is uh, able to in a way to combine its modernity, uh, its modern strength with its ancient and solid roots. So by Attila Mohilny we see uh, two different caves, a new one, a modern one and an ancient one, um, which um, can coexist together in a very good uh, way and this uh, combination of something uh, ancient, solid, uh, authentic with modernity uh, empowers its inhabitants to um, build their own future and to look forward. Uh, this once again was uh, the Kiev, the uh, mythical Kiev that we encounter by um, Attila Mohelli. Uh, we will now go around um, 10, 15 years uh, later and we'll have uh, a quick uh, look at the Kiev of Vyacheslav Levitsky. Uh, Vyacheslav Levitsky is uh, a rather young uh, poet and scholar. As you can see, he was born in um, 1988. Uh, the Kievan theme is very, very important for uh, his um, literary work. Um, I would say that uh, we see some traces of uh, Mohilny's mythical Kiev by uh, Levitsky, but we also see something completely different. Uh, in Levitsky's uh, poetry, uh, we see a combination of um, avant-garde style, once again a focus on everyday life, but also once again a combination of modernity and uh, the ancient uh, roots of the city. So we see some common elements with, uh, with Mohilny, but also something completely different, uh, as uh, you will see uh, soon. And uh, I would say that Vyacheslav Levitsky is also commendable for his very skillful mastery of poetic language, as you can see. So uh, I'll uh, quickly read the Ukrainian text once again, and you can have a look at my very basic uh, translation attempt. Kyjeve, ty taki sonetno jazycznicki Kyjeve i do tebe jeszcze jazyki wystymuć, jazyki odkryjuć i czutliwo i wydywo, ty taki asonansno sonetny Kyjeve i do tebe nyni może i nie zrymi, znajducja jeszcze kupoliasti rymy. So what do we see here? Once again we see the very solid roots of, um, of the city, but we also see uh, their literary character. We see how literature itself is important for the city, and the city is important for literature. So we see um, architecture, poetry, and the very body of the city merging in one body. This is very fascinating, I think, both from the point of view, from a meta-literary point of view, and from the point of view of the importance of literature and of texts for Ukraine, for Ukrainian culture, and for Ukrainian identity. 
so we've seen an example of Kiev in poetry of the 1990s. This is taken from the poetry of the first decade of the century and of the millennium. And we will now go uh, quickly go forward to a contemporary Ukrainian uh, poetry in um, the stricter sense of uh, the term. That is to the p two poets on uh, whom we will focus, Pavlo Korobchuk and um, Yakiva. Uh, the poetry by Pavlo Korobchuk that uh, we are going um, to read is taken from his uh, collection Hvoya, which means uh, pine uh, needle. It has a very interesting title, Virsh na povstanja na vulici Hrushevskoho, that is poem on the uprising on uh, Hrushevsky street. Uh, I find this title very fascinating because it reminds me of 18th century uh, poetry, of Russian 18th century poetry, uh, Lamanosov, Dirjavin and uh, those authors. So it's very fascinating to see how this title title is combined with a very contemporary um, poetics. Uh, as you can see, the poem is pretty long. I will read it in Ukrainian and then um, uh, while I will uh, be discussing it, you can have a look at the translation. Vecir zema 2014 rik, zamist pomade na divočih v ustah triške saži. Pomiš barabannami odarami čolovik na liktari rozhledaje palajući avtozaki ta inši pejzaži. U misti vina, desiatki ljudi poraneno, menedžer hotuje zapalnu sumiš iz pinoplastu, miš krekami ta vebohami čuti pisni iz Majdanu. Pensionerka hrestica v budivelni kasci svohodno klasnika, s jakim nosil miške zimovi na barikaditi v pisna vzhodom za čaško jukave, ko le vdevisja pri perši rozmovi v rozrizhi hoba laklave. Zaraz vi vojujete tam, da ne zdatni pomerte, probihajete ploščaju posred harjačih hils, i ki dajete brukivku, jaka vyražaje vidvertu političnu poziciju i je sposobom stremanja sliz. Čeres kilka hodin, sutičok, desiatki vzpalenih šin, pislja otremanja rani na stehni ta lehko i kontuziji, vi prosto potisnete ruki i rozbižite si do družen. Ti, kto razom blesko boli bilja smerti, do smerti druzi. A v doma, v dvoh iz kohanoju, skilki broh jih ne minulo, vi nas zavždi zrozumijete i istina cja prosta, naj palkiši po cilunok toj, s čo s prezmakom hazu na vustah. Najščeriša vina brez, bez prisutnosti zlosti. Najsrdešnišni ljudi posred nas. Bože vrjatuj peremošciv, kohana podaj proti haz. Uh, it's a very strong, um, very powerful uh, poem and I think it's very important for uh, the development, the evolution of uh, the Kievan text in uh, Ukrainian poetry and um, Ukrainian literature. Uh, what do we see here when it comes to the image of Kiev, to the image of uh, the city? Uh, we see that all the layers of the population of the city are uh, busy uh, pursuing the same cause. Uh, they are all fighting the same fight. Uh, we see the manager, we see the old lady, we see these young guys. Everyone is uh, mm, fighting exactly for the same things. People are ready to die in order to uh, achieve uh, what they have planned to uh, achieve. And they are suffering in the same way as the city itself is suffering. They are wounded, the city is wounded, the city is, uh, the, the center of the city is destroyed. People uh, are wounded both uh, when it comes to, I mean, their bodies and uh, their souls. But both the city and the people who uh, live in it, who uh, inhabit it, are in a way conscious of the importance of what they are fighting for and they are striving to achieve what um, they feel that they need to, um, to achieve. Um, we also see how the events uh, which uh, are taking place in the city uh, are able to change the lives of uh, its inhabitants uh, forever. Uh, 
people we will always remember that the hottest kiss is the one with the gas flavor on your lips um, and people are able to uh, recognize each other not having seen each other for several years because exactly because they are fighting uh, the same fight basically what we see here when it comes to the image of the city is that the city and its inhabitants have become one they are the same thing and they are suffering exactly um, in, um, in the same way um, uh, from the point of view of um, poetic language, we see, of course, something completely different from that um, mythical image of an ancient Slavic cave that we uh, encountered both by um, Mohelny uh, and by Levitsky. But uh, Kiev in this poem continues uh, to remain a mythical place. It's just a completely different myth. It's a myth with brand new uh, foundations, uh, which basically has nothing to do with uh, the medieval heritage of the city. It's a myth that its uh, inhabitants are building Ik et Nunc, now and here, in 2014, in the city of Kiev, and that, as we can see from uh, in the second part of, uh, of the poem, it's a myth that is uh, there to stay and in the future people will uh, remember what, uh, what happened in the city in those days, they will be probably proud of it and their life will be forever changed by that fight that everyone, that all layers of uh, the inhabitants of the city are fighting together. So we see the foundation of a new myth uh, which uh, substitutes, which takes the, takes the place of both the medieval myth and the Soviet myth that we uh, encountered by um, older poets. Um, we're now going to uh, read um, a poem by um, Iakiva in which, uh, as you will see soon, we see something completely different. Um, before reading uh, the poem on which I want to focus in its entirety, we will also uh, have a quick look at another poem by uh, Iakiva, of which I decided to include just one very brief, very short uh, excerpt. Uh, so first of all, who is um, Iakiva? Uh, Iakiva is uh, a poet, uh, she's the same age as Pavlo Korobchuk, they were both born in 1984. Uh, Pavlo Korobchuk is from Lutsk, I should have said this before, but he moved to Kiev for uh, his studies, that is already uh, some, um, a number of years ago. While Iakiva had to move to Kiev from her native city of Donetsk after the occupation of uh, Donetsk <coughs> by uh, Russia backed uh, separatists, um, as we know. So basically, Iakiva is an internally displaced person. Uh, she is in Kiev because she had to leave her city. Uh, and this uh, impacts her outlook on the city, uh, on the place in which uh, she's living, working, writing, and uh, about which she also talks, as we can see uh, in uh, her writings. Um, the two poems that we're going to read and discuss uh, are taken by her first published uh, collection, which is called uh, Padalce a Traia, Farther Away from Paradise, and the very title of her poetry collection is, I would say, rather significant. So, uh, the lyrical subject of this collection is not in paradise, but it's also farther away from paradise, perhaps, than uh, she was uh, before. Uh, but let us now have a look uh, at the text themselves, so it will be easier to, to discuss Kiva's outlook on Kiev after having read the text, and to compare it with Korobchuk. Я живу между бабьим яром и сирийским концлагерем. Каждый день, возвращаясь домой дорогою смерти, я оказываюсь до военном пердичеве. 
As I mentioned, Iakiva uh, writes predominantly in Russian, but she also writes in Ukrainian, and she has a strong interest for other cultures too, including uh, the Jewish one and uh, Polish culture too. Uh, in this poem, uh, uh, in this excerpt, which is taken from a longer poem, we see um, very uh, clearly identifiable um, uh, references to uh, the Jewish uh, theme, uh, Babi Yar and the Syrietsky uh, concentration camp, and Berdici, which is of course not in Kiev, but uh, Western than Kiev, not far away from uh, Zhitomer. Uh, what do we see here? Here we see a lyrical subject uh, which identifies the place in which it or she is living basically with death itself. Uh, walking every day in her everyday life, uh, the lyrical subject uh, has the impression to be stuck in a place which she identifies basically with death. We know uh, of the tragedy of Babin, Baben Yar or Babi Yar, uh, where um, the Jewish uh, population of uh, Kiev was uh, annihilated by the Nazis, uh, the Siretz concentration camp, and these references to uh, Berdichiv, that is one of the most important Jewish uh, cities in Ukraine uh, before um, <coughs> World War II. So, uh, Kiva's myth of Kiev, as we can see here, is completely different from uh, Korobchuk's one. Korobchuk's uh, myth of Kiev uh, has, of course, uh, very tragic uh, underpinnings. It's linked with death because Euromaidan, the Revolution of Dignity, uh, is, uh, as we know, tragically linked with death, but it has also a positive outlook on the future. Here we just see uh, the city. Uh, identifying itself with death, and we do not see a future here. But let us have a look at the other text by Kiva to see whether this image, this very tragic image of Kiev is, cons is confirmed or uh, whether we might see something different here. Uh, the text, the title of the text which I decided to include in its entirety is uh, in English. Let's go and I will read uh, the Russian original. Городское пространство противоположно дому, враждебно идее оседлости, между тем очерчено, замкнуто, и что особенно утомительно, совершенно внезапно. Вот скажем, обнаруживая себя на перекрестке улицы Давженко и проспекта Победы, или стоящим на платформе метро Крещатик, или идущим от подолок Европейской площади, что ты здесь делаешь? Или, скажем, слушаешь музыку в местной филармонии, смотришь фильм в местном кинотеатре, пьешь кофе с корицей в местной кавьярне, разговариваешь с местным интеллигентом, воображаешь, что ориентируешься на местности. В сумке не меньше четырех карт Киева, в том числе одна довоенная. Uh, the urban space is the opposite of home and it's hostile to the idea of settlement. The very two first lines of this poem are um, extremely powerful and they draw a sharp distinction between uh, the collective uh, space of the city and basically the space of the self, the space of the soul, uh, if you want. Um, after the first lines, which basically, I mean, have a if you want a philosophical, more general approach, uh, we uh, see uh, once again that uh, the setting of the poem is clearly uh, Kyiv. Uh, Dovzhenko Street, Victory Alley, uh, Hreshatik Station, Podil, Euro uh, European Square. Um, from the point of view of the image of Kyiv, I think that this poem is very interesting because we see uh, different components, different parts of its myth altogether. Dovzhenko Street and Victory Alley, if you want the Soviet Kyiv. Uh, Hreshatik, Hreshatik as we know it's the most important, the central street uh, in downtown, downtown Kyiv, and Hreshatik in a way has always been a myth in pre-Soviet Kyiv, in Soviet Kyiv when uh, as we know it was rebuilt and in, contemporary, uh, in the contemporary city. It's the heart of the city. 
Podil and European Square. Podil, uh, the low city, uh, and European Square, which are not far away from each other, even if it's uh, the walk from the Podil to the European Square seems longer than it is because you have to go uh, uphill. Uh, but why is it interesting? European Square, so we know that uh, Ukraine um, has been claiming its co-participation in uh, the European, in the general, in the common uh, European cultural and political space. And so in this poem we see um, um, a part of the Kievan cultural text that I think we hadn't encountered in uh, the other poems. That is Kiev as uh, the capital of a city which reclaims its uh, Europeanness. Uh, so basically we see uh, several possibilities that a person uh, can choose from while identifying with this city. Uh, the Soviet city, the pre-Soviet city, and the contemporary city with its uh, Europeanness. But uh, in spite of these several choices that um, the, the subject um, can choose from, uh, we see that for her or it, it's very, very difficult to uh, find uh, their place in the city. You imagine that you know your way around, but you actually do not. And we see the lyrical subject writing that it or she pretends to feel at home in this city, uh, going to local places, drinking at a local coffee shop, talking with local intellectuals, but uh, it's impossible for her or he to call this place um, home. Uh, the last thing that I'd like to say about this uh, poem is it uh, concerns its very last word, Davayennaya, pre-war, a word that we encountered in the previous poem by Iakiva too, uh, with reference to uh, Berdiciu. Um, usually I would say that the adjective Davayenne uh, is uh, used uh, talking about um, the years preceding World War II, but after 2014 this adjective has acquired a new connotation in uh, Ukraine, that is, uh, it refers to everything that preceded 2014, because uh, Ukraine uh, uh, has been attacked and um, it uh, has been suffering for war for um, almost five years now, uh, as we know. So we see also this interesting, I would say, linguistic re-evaluation of tragic also, of course, of uh, the term um, Davayenni. Uh, I see that we are uh, almost running out of time, so I'm jumping to my um, conclusions. Uh, so. In contemporary, in extreme contemporary um, Ukrainian uh, poetry, uh, basically we see two main um, varieties of uh, the Kievan uh, myth. So by Pavlo Korobchuk, for example, we see uh, a city that has become one with its uh, inhabitants uh, and in which um, the blood uh, um, that uh, the revolution and war uh, have uh, brought with themselves uh, is uh, in a way, uh, can in a way give the foundation for uh, a bright future to come, for which the inhabitants of the city uh, have still to fight uh, hard. By Iakiva we see something different. Uh, we see the city seen through the eyes of a person who has had to leave uh, her uh, native city and to uh, find shelter uh, in a city which, although being the capital of, uh, of the state uh, in which she lives and from which she's from, is nevertheless in a way a foreign city. So we see displacement uh, embodied in uh, the poetic texts. Um, uh, I've also tried to show how uh, 
Kyiv is in a way a pars pro toto, a synecdoche uh, of uh, Ukraine uh, in general. And uh, from this point of view, I would argue that uh, Kyiv in Ukrainian literature has a more universal character than other uh, Ukrainian uh, cities, such as uh, Lviv and uh, Kharkiv, for example. Cities that has a very strong uh, cultural uh, text, but which perhaps have a more local identity, while uh, Kyiv being uh, the capital of a city which finds itself at war, but not being in the war zone, has the ability to uh, unite in itself the whole of um, Ukraine uh, in its peace and in its uh, uh, war. Before uh, concluding, uh, I would like to read a very brief excerpt of um, a prose text by uh, a person who has just visited this university, Yuri Androkhovich, as you know, one of the most um, important, most famous uh, contemporary uh, Ukrainian uh, writers. I'm going to read a brief excerpt from one of his, uh, uh, of the essays that have been recently published in uh, English uh, translation by the University of Toronto's Press, my final territory. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of sentences from a little bit of urban studies translated by Mark uh, Andrecek, uh, in which Andruhovich gives uh, his uh, view of the Ukrainian capital. Uh, Kyiv in general exists in a zone of different non-Ukrainian mental psychological influences. The constant influx of absolutely prototypical Ukrainianness from far away or nearby towns and villages is unable to change Kyiv. The opposite occurs. Kyiv changes the Ukrainianness. The most perceptible manifestation of this is the completely mechanical nature of Kyiv's urban existence. Unlike all other European capitals, in Kyiv there is no movable fist, regardless of all the former popular gatherings that take place in the city. The massive movement of faceless streams of people, a mutual anxiety, isolation and inclination towards clashing aggression, the lack of improvisation, spiritual delight and play with interrelations, all of these show the Kievan populace to be a gigantic, chaotic collection of people who don't know and have no need for one another. Uh, this, was text, uh, this text was written in 1999. It's, of course, very ironic, as most of the things that uh, Yuri Androkhovich writes uh, and has written. Um, I would say that the poems, that some of the poems at least, that uh, we have read and uh, discussed today show us a different Kiev from the one that uh, Androkhovich uh, uh, wrote about in uh, 1999. Uh, we see how diverse the Kievan cultural text is. We see how diverse writers' responses to what has been going on in the city in uh, um, the last uh, years is. Uh, but once again, we have to be aware of the fact that the situation is constantly changing and this, is always, this has always been reflected in literature, which in Ukraine is extremely responsive to what is going on uh, in the country. Thank you very much for your attention.